today's class. Uh, the topic we are going to discuss today is uh, fluorescence quenching. But before uh, you know, we go into the topic, let us look at what we have uh, covered in the last class. Just a quick recap. So, you know, we started with the Jablonski diagram because uh, we are talking about fluorescence, right? And we know that in the Jablonski diagram, you have uh, these uh, different um, excited state processes. Say, for example, uh, this VR is corresponds to vibration relaxation, then ISC corresponds to inter-system crossing. Then if you have radiative uh, transfer or other radiative uh, de-excitation from your triplet state to your singlet state, then it is phosphorescence. If it is from singlet state, uh, excited state to the singlet ground state, radiative, then it is uh, fluorescence. And also, also you have uh, a host of non-radiative processes, right. Now, because you know this is a course on biophysical chemistry and we are mainly focusing on proteins, so one of our goals always is to look at the application of fluorescence uh, with respect to proteins, right. So, what we are seeing out here is that there are four different proteins, okay, having you know different extents of exposure for their respective tryptophan residues. Now, keep in mind this we had covered in the last class, but just kind of uh, doing a quick recap. So, in number 1, what is happening is, in number 1, your tryptophan, which is in the red uh, ball uh, thing coloration is buried right. In uh, number 2, it is a little more exposed and if you uh, can compare uh, with uh, this uh, schematic which is uh, down here. So, number 1 is in uh, mostly in the interior of the protein, number 2 is a little uh, less uh, in the interior of the protein, number 3 is kind of at the interface, one part uh, is in the interior, the other part is exposed and number 4 which is uh, this one, you can see this is the number 4 and hence this is number 4, this is fully exposed. So, what do you expect? What we expect is and if you would remember our discussion on fluorescence, then for the buried tryptophan, because it is mostly in a hydrophobic environment, which is here for protein 1, that its fluorescence maximum would be most blue shifted and for 4, it should be most red shifted. That means, it should be occurring at the highest wavelength among these 4 different proteins. Now, do we see that? That is exactly what we see, right? You look at this uh, number 1, position 1. Position 1 was the case where it was solely in the interior of the protein. So, you can see out here how blue shifted with respect to the others it is. Then 2, it is a little less on the interior side, 3. So, for 3 what has happened is, it is kind of both facing towards the interior and a part of it is exposed and number 4, it is fully exposed and you can see how the wavelength has shifted from 1 to 4 towards the redder side or the higher wavelength. Now, this is typically what is observed. So, that means, if you take a protein and if you would look at the tryptophan emission maximum, then you would be having an idea of, okay, to what extent is this tryptophan buried or to what extent is it exposed from the emission maximum. Now, this is another case where uh, we are looking at the effect of denaturation on the fluorescence uh, profile. So, you know, without worrying too much about the fluorescence intensity right now, if you look at the native state, the native state was is the one where it is most buried. So, this is the tryptophan W48 we are talking about in this protein. So, the native state has the most blue shifted emission maximum. Then, when you denature it, that means you have added say guanine hydrochloride, a chemical denaturant, which is which has kind of uh, denatured the protein to a huge extent. Then, you see what has happened to the tryptophan intensity. The tryptophan intensity or rather uh, the emission maximum has shifted well to the red side or higher wavelength. This is very similar to what we saw in the previous slide, but remember in the previous slide we were co considering four uh, different proteins, right? That means different exposures. In this case, it is also an exposure case, but on a s for a single protein. That means we started with the protein; it was in the native state, no denaturant. The tryptophan was very much in the interior of the protein. Now, when you start opening the protein up with the help of the denaturant going to hydrochloride, what is happening is that means the tryptophan is slowly coming out from the interior towards the exterior, towards the exposed side. It is getting exposed to the solid molecules, and hence its fluorescence is shifting to the red. Okay. Now, what you have here? Now, please uh, keep in mind here. You can see this lambda excitation, which has been underlined, is uh, 292 nanometers. Now, the reason for two uh, taking this lambda excitation is this. Now. If you go back to our previous discussions, in proteins along with tryptophan, we have two other fluorophores, tyrosine and phenylalanine. Now, tyrosine and tryptophan 
have very close absorption spectra. When I say very close, I mean that if you are exciting at 285 or 280, what is going to happen is you are going to excite both tyrosine and tryptophan. But if you are exciting at 292 nanometers, what you will see is that 292, the absorption spectrum of tyrosine has almost died down. That means, the absorption is really low, while that of tryptophan is still pretty high. That means, you are solely or at least exclusively exciting tryptophan as compared to tyrosine. So, that is why if you look at the comparison of this lambda excitation is equal to 292 nanometers as compared to lambda excitation equal to 275 nanometers. That means, we are exciting at 275, where tyrosine also has appreciable absorbance. Same for tryptophan. So, you can see you can uh, you will see the tyrosine emission maximum out here or the tyrosine emission coming out close to 300 and then also for this is tryptophan which is you know still there. Okay. So, this is kind of where we had uh, stopped in the last class right and this is where we are getting introduced to how people use fluorescence for proteins. Now, there is one very important thing that people often use. Now, your question might be okay, we have talked about burial and exposure of these tryptophan residues. Now, you can ask me how would I identify or how would I see or how would I probe or how would I investigate to what extent it is buried or to what extent is it, is it exposed right. So, or suppose I am taking two different proteins, I do not know anything else, I do not know the structure, say the crystal structure is not available. Can I do a simple set of experiments to figure out in which case the tryptophan is more exposed as compared to the other one? Obviously, one is fluorescence emission. Now, the other case or the other type of experiments that people generally carry out is referred to as fluorescence quenching or quenching of fluorescence. Now, before going into the very specifics of this, let us talk about this quenching uh, process in details. So, what is quenching? So, any process that brings about a decrease in the sample emission is referred to as fluorescence quenching. That means, any process right, it does not have to be a particular process, it can be any, per any process by which you see that your fluorescence intensity has decreased. Now, for proteins the type of quenching because we are going to mainly focus on proteins the type of quenching we will be primarily concerned with is that arising from collision between the quencher and the fluorophore. So, say the fluorophore is tryptophan let us stick to tryptophan for simplicity sake and the quencher will be another molecule and I will tell you what those molecules are as we progress through outer uh, you know through uh, with a lecture today. So, what are the different types of quenching processes of out there? One is dynamic quenching. Okay. This is essentially collision in nature that means, you have a quencher molecule you have a fluorophore again we will soon come to this in uh, a couple of slides and this quencher molecule will collide with the fluorophore and result in quenching. Okay. This is called dynamic quenching. Another one is called static quenching this is also type of quenching, but it is slightly different from that of dynamic quenching the mechanism is and the third one is uh, known as the sphere of action quenching. But the two that we will mostly focus on are dynamic and static and that is what we will discuss in some details. So, before going into the details of the mechanism or what uh, uh, you know dynamic and static quenching are let us look at some commonly used quenches. So, one is molecular oxygen right. So, oxygen has been proposed to bring about quenching by enhancing uh, inter system crossing to the triplet state because of its paramagnetic nature. That means, if you have enough dissolved oxygen or if you have dissolved oxygen in your solvent which in most cases you have and the amount of uh, you know dissolved oxygen you have will depend upon the solvent you have your proteins in, but your proteins mostly are in water right. So, our buffer. So, this oxygen what will happen is it will diffuse and collide with your uh, fluorophore tryptophan say and bring about quenching. So, you can understand that the more oxygen you will have that means, the more dissolved oxygen you will be having the more will be the uh, quenching effect. So, even without you know deriving anything or looking at an equation you would uh, you know try to guess that this extent of quenching would have a concentration dependence that is would be depend upon the concentration of the quencher in some way or the other you know that is very straightforward to kind of realize or appreciate. Another class of uh, quencher molecules halides iodide and bromide they bring about heavy ion quenching now this we have talked about before you know with regards to spin orbit coupling that is it, it you know these halides these heavy uh, halides or heavy atoms introduce enhanced spin orbit coupling resulting in inter system crossing. Okay. Now, this is also something we have discussed before right this is not new to you, but it is just that now we are discussing it in the realm of fluorescence quenching. 
Now, there are also another class of molecules, amides, succinamide, acrylamide. Now, acrylamide is the one I am going to refer to here. This is also a very commonly used protein fluorescence quencher, right. Now, what is it? Let us now let us go into the theory. What is the theory of uh, dynamic quenching or collisional quenching, okay. Now, you have a fluorophore out here as you have uh, as, as uh, shown out here, you know this is a fluorophore, okay. Now, what do you have? You have a quencher molecule. Now, not necessarily these, uh, you know, these sizes are just a schematic, right. They can be have, having the same sizes, the fluorophore can be a little bigger or uh, bigger than the quencher and so on. Now, if I am talking about dynamic or collisional quenching, what I am saying is this, the quencher collides with the fluorophore. The moment it collides with the fluorophore, what it, what happens is, it de excites it from its excited state giving rise to a uh, giving rise to a decrease in fluorescence. Now, this is typically what happens in case of dynamic quenching. So, collision quenching is commonly described by stern volmer equation. Now, let me again repeat the dynamic quenching is often referred to as collisional quenching because as you are seeing on the arrow it is a written collision. Only when the collision is happening is the quenching seen, right. So, that means for the quencher to go to the fluorophore it has to, it has to diffuse and then collide. So, diffusion you can understand would play a very important part in this collision or in this uh, type of quenching. So, the stern volmer equation or equations because we will be look at, looking at um, uh, a few more equations uh, later. These are a classic set of equations, these are a classic set of equations that will describe most of the types of quenching that we encounter. So, what it says is F 0, I will tell you what F 0 by F you know F 0 F and these are, F 0 by F is equal to 1 plus k S V, where S V stands for Stern Volmer times concentration of Q. Now, again let me mention this or let me repeat this rather. Remember we we talked about the fact that it is easy to understand the higher the quench concentration is the more will be a quenching. That means, there will be a dependence upon your quencher concentration. This is exactly what you see out here, where Q is your quencher concentration and you can see the F 0 by F, this is a measure of your fluorescence quenching right is equal to 1 plus a certain constant which is K is V called the transformer constant times the concentration of the quencher. Now, let us expand on this equation, let us try to understand what these uh, different parameters mean. So, again looking at this equation, what is F 0? So, F 0 it is a fluorescence intensity in absence of the quencher ok, that is what 0 means, 0 essentially means that 0 quencher concentration. That means, this is the initial fluorescence intensity we have when you have no quencher molecule present in your sample solution right. Then what is F? Obviously, then you can understand what F is, it is a fluorescence intensity in presence of the quencher right, has to be because now you are putting a quencher in depending upon what concentration of quencher you have and what quencher you have obviously, accordingly the fluorescence intensity of the corresponding fluorophore will diminish. Now, also keep in mind if you are talking about a protein right, if you are talking about a protein then this amount of quenching will also uh, depend upon the exposure of that tryptophan residue because we are mainly talking about tryptophans just to keep the things simple right. So, you know quite a factors have to be kept in mind it is just not one factor right. So, next what is KSV? It is called the stern volmer constant and look at the unit it is molar inverse ok. Now, generally concentration is expressed in molar concentration right and hence if you look at this equation again this is F 0 by F is equal to 1 plus K S V times Q. Now, 1 obviously is dimensionless. So, K S V times Q. So, if Q is concentration moles or molar concentration then K S V has to have the inverse of that because you are adding this to a dimensionless quantity. So, this quantity also has to be dimensionless. So, that is the easiest way of figuring out what the unit for K S V is right. So, if you ever have any you know doubts, if you ever are confused then just look at this equation and make a dimension comparison ok. Now, also what is F 0 by F? See F 0 by F remember because we are talking about fluorescence quenching F is always less than F 0. Now, F 0 by F that means 
f is the fluorescence intensity in the presence of the quencher. So, what you can understand is f 0 by f will always increase because with increase in quencher concentration your f is decreasing, but f 0 was always the same right. So, that means you will see an increasing trend and it is mostly linear based on this equation right. So, again what is q? q is the concentration of the quencher. So, to recap this part this is the stern volmer equation for collisional quenching or dynamic quenching where k is if is a stern volmer constant f0 is a fluorescence intensity in the absence of the quencher f is a fluorescence intensity in the presence of the quencher and q is the quencher concentration so what you can understand is if i'm going to plot f0 by f versus the concentration of quencher i'm expecting a straight line isn't it and the slope is going to give me the value of ksv right now ksv We'll come to uh, that uh, graphical interpretation later. But what is KSV? KSV is also can also be uh, written as KQ times tau zero. Now here, see, all this time we have been talking about the steady-state fluorescence intensity, right? This is what we measure using a normal steady-state spectrometer, or uh, I mean uh, fluorometer. But here you see KSV has a different dependence. That means it is also dependent upon the lifetime tau zero. So what is tau zero? Tau 0 is the lifetime of the fluorophore in the absence of the quencher, right. So, here is tau 0, it is the lifetime of the fluorophore in the absence of the quencher, like F0. F0 was the intensity of the fluor, the fluorescence intensity of the fluorophore in the absence of the quencher. Tau 0 is the lifetime in the absence of the quencher. What is KQ? KQ is a bimolecular quenching rate constant. What do you mean by bimolecular quenching rate constant? It should be easy to conceive because remember we are talking about a collision and hence collision has to be between two molecules, hence bimolecular, right. So, collisional quenching. Now, why did we bring in this uh, lifetime issue? So, collisional quenching also depopulates the excited state of the fluorophore and hence has a similar effect on the lifetime. Okay? I repeat, collisional quenching also depopulates the excited state of the fluorophore and hence must be having a similar effect on the lifetime. Now, this is easy to understand. Now, suppose you have a fluorophore right, and you have excited the fluorophore to the excited state. Right? Now, you have a quencher whatever the quencher molecule is. The quencher molecule collides, the moment it collides what it happens, so what happens is it de excites that means it gives rise to another non radiative pathway in case of this collision or dynamic quenching. Moment you have another non radiative pathway what will happen is the quantum level of the fluorescence will decrease because remember that KNR this quenching pr uh, process de excitation would add to that KNR right that is K non radiative remember what we talked about before in case of lifetime and hence it would also decrease your lifetime and so your fluorescence quantum mean. Hence, you see an effect on lifetime and you also see an effect on your steady state intensity. Okay. So, here this is what you see again that is why tau 0 by tau now is equal to 1 plus k is v times q. Again having the same meaning see 1 plus k is v times q is the same thing you saw for f 0 by f that was equation 2 for you the rather equation 1 in the previous slide. Tau 0 by tau, tau 0 we have just said what it is it is uh, in this slide while tau what it is? Tau is now the lifetime of the fluorophore in presence of the quencher. It is very similar to what we had said for F, right. So, thus for correlational quenching, if we can summarize, this is what we have. So, F0 by F, F has to be equal to tau 0 by tau. That means the ratio of the steady state intensity has to be equal to the ratio of the lifetimes. Since this quenching process is based on diffusion, remember we talked about this, right? This is a collisional quenching for collision, these two have to will have to collide, and if for them to collide, they will have to diffuse towards each other. So, then we can apply our diffusion theory based on the Smolichewski expression. If you would remember what we had, uh, you know, talked sometime back about the Smolichewski expression, we derived it. So, this is what it looks like. So, this k r0 is equal to 4 pi f r0 d a plus d b times 10 to the power 3 times n where n is Avogadro's number. Now, what is d a plus d b? Simple if you remember d a and d b. So, d is the respective uh, diameter and a and b are the respective uh, you know diffusing species. Here the if the fluorophore is a part of the protein then it is the for the protein and in that case is the other case is the quencher. So, we can now further write this k r 0 as r 0 equal to r a plus r b, where r a plus r b. Now, 
just uh, you know to uh, go back uh, just missed one thing so this d which i said uh, to be the diameter is actually it's not right this uh, d um, is the diffusion constant right so these two are moving towards each other so d is a diffusion constant of uh, species a and d is a diffusion constant of uh, species b it's it's not the diameter now r where the distance comes in r0 is equal to ra plus rb this is the radius of that particular uh, species right whether it's of the protein or the quencher depending upon what you have what we now do is we just replace kr0 by k0 okay so now what we have is then k0 is equal to 4 pi f times ra plus rb times da plus db then the rest of the expression and hence we can write this as k0 is equal to f times kq right where kq is the whole of the expression apart from f now what does f mean see f is essentially the frequency of collision so what it means is suppose i'm ha i'm having 100 collisions right and if out of 100 collisions all the collisions bring about quenching then my success is 100% that means f is equal to 1 however out of 100 molecules if only 50 collisions that means of 100 collisions if 50 collisions bring about quenching right then my f would be 0 0.5 so f is essentially related to the frequency or the effectiveness of the quenching process so then what we have is for f is equal to 1 the bimolecular quenching constant kq remember this is what kq we saw before where k is v is equal to kq times tau 0 this is equal to the diffusion limited rate constant k0 right so k0 is the diffusion limited rate constant and if each and every collision is effective f is equal to 1 then kq is equal to k0 now that's what this expression is telling you now as promised let's look at uh, the Sternwormer plot so what does it say so whether we have we are plotting f0 by f or tau0 by tau on the y axis against the concentration of q so what is going to happen is you can see it always starts from 1 the intercept is 1 and then it goes on increasing in a linear fashion now why does it start from 1 it is easy to understand because at 1 that means at this place the quencher concentration is 0 so the quencher concentration being 0 f this f in the denominator would be f0 and f0 by f0 is 1 same for tau0 by tau0 is equal to 1 that is why it starts from 1 and then it increases now this low is essentially your ksv that is what it says so your ksv is equal to kq times tau0 so okay so then for collision quenching there are two ways of looking at it one is you can look at the steady state uh, fluorescence intensity changes and the other one is you can also look at the lifetime right you know both of these are similar if it is a dynamic quenching f0 by f should be equal to tau0 by tau as we just discussed so you can use either of these right but then there is a reason why we are going through this or why we are discussing this equivalence of f0 by f is equal to tau0 by tau it will be very instrumental when we try to differentiate between different types of quenching okay so now as you saw this was a linear graph but does a linear graph guarantee that you are having dynamic or collisional quenching so as it says However, a linear graph obtained when plotting f0 by f does not signify the presence of dynamic or collision quenching only. Now, this is extremely important. Why? Because remember, when we are talking when we are talking about types of quenching, we are talked about different types of quenching. One was dynamic, the one we just discussed, the other one was static, and then we had sphere of action. Okay. Now, leaving aside sphere of action, then what is static quenching? Okay, how do I you know how is it different from dynamic quenching? Let us try to take a look at it. So here we start discussing about static quenching so what is static you know what do you mean by static quenching what when can you see static quenching so there are cases where the fluorophore can form a stable complex as written here with another molecule which here is the quencher because we are talking about a fluorescence about fluorescence quenching now if this ground state is non fluorescent then we say that the fluorophore has been statically quenched now please keep this difference in mind when you are having a dynamic quenching you are not forming any ground, ground state complex what are you looking at you are only looking at a collision collision between these two different molecules either the fluorophore by itself or the fluorophore when it is a part of a protein molecule and the quencher molecule right now in case of static quenching however what is happening so the quencher molecule has to form a complex in the ground state with that of the fluorophore okay so that means it comes it binds and forms a complex so here you will be having something known as a complexation constant or equilibrium constant because it is forming a ground state complex 
yes, it definitely has to collide. It will form the complex after it, you know, collides. But then, in case of dynamic quenching, after collision, it will never stay there. It will, you know, it, it will always move in, collide, and move out. But in case of static quenching, when it comes, it stays and forms a complex, right? This is the difference, and there will be more differences later, as you will see. So here also, here also, the Stern-Wormwald relation goes like F0 by F is equal to 1 plus Ks times concentration of Q. Now please keep this in mind. In the previous case, we said Ksv, which was the Stern-Wormwald constant. In this case, it is Ks. Okay, it is a static quenching constant. And what is Ks? Let's take a look at it. But before you know, going to the next slide, let's see what we uh, have written here. Realize this fact that here too, if you are plotting F0 by F against a quencher concentration, then we are going to have a straight line identical to dynamic quenching. But as we just discussed, it is not dynamic quenching, right? It is static quenching. Then how do we differentiate between these two? Because both these, if they are occurring individually, both these would give rise to respective straight uh, plots or you know straight lines or linear plots, right? So then in that case, how would you figure out? Okay. So looking at static quenching again, Ks, as I said, is association constant. That means uh, the, f uh, the constant uh, with regards to the uh, complex formation. So the complex formation is F plus Q giving F Q because it forms a complex. Now F is the fluorophore, Q is the quencher, and the ground state complex and the ground state complex formed is F Q. Okay. So then, the moment I have this, then I can give rise to, or you can write down an equilibrium constant expression. So that means K S is equal to concentration of F Q over concentration of F times concentration of Q. Right? Now, this is the expression for K s, the static quenching constant as opposed to the dynamic quenching constant K s v which was equal to K q times tau 0. So, look at this now. In the dynamic quenching constant that K s v, that K s v could be equated to K q, the bimolecular quenching constant times the lifetime tau 0 in absence of the quencher. Okay, that means that is why we could have that, equi that equivalence between the lifetime and the steady state intensity, but here no lifetime is coming into play. So, possibly we are not going to have that. So, how do we differentiate dynamic from static? You now, this is what I was telling you before. You look at this. First, look at the right hand side, right? On the right hand side, what we are seeing is on the y axis, that means on the right plot, on the y axis we are plotting f0 by f. Now, by this time we are familiar with what f0 by f means, right, against concentration of quencher. So, here you can see we are having a straight line, right. So, that means f0 by f against concentration of quencher is having, is giving a straight line. But the same is obtained for dynamic quenching too, right. If you look at, uh, if you look now at the left hand side, or the left plot, but just see on the y axis of the left figure or the left panel, what we are writing out here is f 0 by f and tau 0 by tau. Now, because f 0 by f and tau 0 by tau, they were equal, f 0 by f was equal to tau 0 by tau, then it does not matter which one we plot, we are going to get the same straight line, right, like this it is a linearly increasing plot. However, you look at the right panel now. On the y axis, I only have f 0 by f. We, we do not have tau 0 by tau. However, if we do try to plot tau 0 by tau and if this is a case of static quenching only, that means there is no other quenching involved, only a case of static quenching, then you can see how it is out here. So, this is tau 0 by tau. The tau 0 by tau, however, does not follow the f 0 by f. That means, tau 0 by tau is always equal to 1. In other words, what it says is that means in case of static quenching, the lifetime does not change. Okay, that means the lifetime of the fluorophore is not affected. You have formed a ground state complex. The fluorescence is totally quenched. You never observe fluorescence from those molecules. On the contrary, whatever molecule is not complexed, you're exciting, and you're getting the fluorescence from that molecule. So, that means that tau 0 or that tau is always equal to tau 0, because whatever molecules are exciting, they are coming down 
fluorescing because they are not complexed, right? So this is the major difference between these two. So if you would if you would be getting straight line plots, how would you differentiate or how would you you know try to answer the question whether it is dynamic or static? So what you would do is to see it's dynamic, you have to plot tau zero by tau. That means you have to do lifetime measurements. That's one of the easiest ways of doing it. If lifetime measurement, that is tau zero by tau, follows f zero by f, just like your first panel or left hand panel, then you know it is a case of collisional quenching or dynamic quenching. However, if tau zero by tau follows this plot, that means almost shows no change, then it is a case of static quenching. So this is one of the best ways of trying to figure out which one is static or which one is uh, which process is static uh, quenching process, which process is a dynamic quenching process. But is this the only way we can differentiate? Well, this is one of the best ways definitely, but not the only way. Let us look at another way, but just uh, to uh, you know kind of uh, go through it again. So based on the previous slide, the slide we were just discussing, measurement of the fluorescence lifetime is the best way of distinguishing the two types of quenching. For static quenching, the ground state complexes are non-fluorescent and hence the lifetime is only due to the uncomplexed fluorophore. That means that fluorophore which is free, which is not complex with Q. Now, lifetime of the unpowdered fluorophore that is tau 0, you know it is tau 0, right. So, because it is unpowdered, so let me go back. So, lifetime of the unpowdered fluorophore is tau 0, that is what you just said and hence for static quenching tau 0 by tau is always equal to 1, because that tau in the denominator, the tau in the denominator is also tau 0, because you are only looking at uncomplexed fluorophore fluorescing. However, for dynamic quenching, what is happening? For dynamic quenching, you have seen tau 0 by tau is equal to f 0 by f. So again, this is one of the best ways of trying to figure out the difference between these two, right, or which one is which. Now, as I said, is this the only one or is this the only way to differentiate? No. There is another effect, the temperature effect. Now, try to realize what is going to happen. Again, look at the left curve. In the left curve, we are having dynamic quenching. So, T 1 and T 2 are the different temperatures where T 2 is greater than T 1. Now, think about this, when you are going to increase temperature, you are going to put in, uh, you are going to increase thermal energy of the molecules and hence it is going to uh, increase the diffusion rate. The moment it increases the diffusion rate, what will happen is it will collide at a higher frequency, at a higher rate and hence if your dynamic quenching is purely or rather your quenching is purely dynamic, then the effect of quenching or the rate of quenching will increase. That means the slope, the slope would get steeper and the slope would increase. So that is exactly what you are seeing out here. You can see the slope is Ksv for dynamic quenching. This is T1, this is T1, this is T2. T1, T2 is greater than T1. So because it is a higher temperature and as I said, diffusion increases, right? And hence you have much more quenching in case of dynamic. However, the reverse is seen for static quenching. Now remember you are talking about a complex. Now generally what happens is when you would if it is you know if it is a loosely formed complex and if you would be increasing the temperature, what would happen? What would happen is the complex would break apart. So this is exactly what you are seeing out here. So here for static quenching at T1, this is the slope you are looking at, but at T2 what has happened is the slope has decreased. Why? Because the quenching has decreased. Why? Because the complex you are form, you're forming at the high temperature is not as stable as it was at the lower temperature and hence you can see the quenching has decreased. Okay. So this is also another way by looking at the temperature difference, you can figure out which one is which, that means which one is dynamic, which one is static, right. So as we just you know discussed, higher temperature leads to faster diffusion, remember higher temperature also brings about a decrease in the solvent viscosity and hence leads to enhanced dynamic quenching. For static quenching and higher temperatures, weakly bound complexes which these are, you know these uh, static quenching uh, complexes are, they break apart thereby reducing the extent of static quenching. Okay? So now you have two ways of looking at it, one is by uh, measuring lifetime changes and the other one is by measuring uh, you know the temperature dependence. Okay. Now there is also just be, uh, before I go uh, to this slide, uh, let me tell you one thing. So when in many cases it has been found that if you would look at the absorption spectrum in case of a static quenching, because it forms a ground state complex, right? then the absorption uh, spectrum would be different than that of the uncomplex fluorophore in case of a 
static quenching case. However, in case of dynamic quenching, you do not have any complex formation and hence you would not be having any such changes in absorbance. Good. So, we have talked about two individual types of quenching, one is static, one is dynamic. We started with dynamic and then we said okay, static is different from dynamic, but both exhibiting linear plots if they are occurring if they are occurring individually. Now, you can have cases right, you can have cases where both are operating together. So, it can be shown in that case that the f 0 by f you know which we are familiar by now is equal to the product of the two that means 1 plus k is v times q which is the dynamic part and 1 plus k is times concentration of q which is the static part. And so, if you go on and expand it you will see that you have a quadratic right in uh, q which so, here you have the uh, you have the q square term. Now, this can be simplified as try it out by yourself where f 0 by f is equal to 1 plus k apparent times concentration of q and this k apparent has this expression you know just uh, 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 simple algebra manipulation and you will get this expression right. So, what you can see now is here if you are going to plot f 0 by f for a case where you have a combined static and dynamic quenching that means both are occurring simultaneously you would not be getting a straight line other uh, on the contrary you would be getting a curve plot because of this quadratic dependence is that what you see let us see this is what you see right this is f 0 by f again against concentration of q you can see how this plot is curved this is a case of static plus dynamic and this curvature you can understand or is arising from that quadratic term okay however if you talk about the dynamic then this is what it should look like. So, what is this you know so what is this um, graph telling you let us go through it again. The red curve the red plot or the red curve is a combination of two types of quenching process static and dynamic. Now, suppose you are asked to figure out okay, what is the contribution of dynamic quenching here what would you do. Now, you know that this is a combined case, but also what you know is the static quenching there is no lifetime dependence. In case of dynamic quenching the lifetime just follows the same trend as the fluorescence intensity. So, if you would do this tau 0 by tau then what you would figure out is you would be able to extract you would be able to extract the dynamic part from the combined static and dynamic. So, this that is essentially what has been shown here. So, this red plot again is the combined one and the blue plot is a tau 0 by tau which is telling you that this is the dynamic part of that combined plot. Remember if you will be plotting tau 0 by tau for the static one it should be just parallel to the x axis that means it should be 1. So, as I uh, just said the upward curvature of the combined quenching process this results from the second order equation is equation 10 in q right. So, quenching plots with downward curvatures. Now, recap what did we start from we started from dynamic quenching linear plot we looked at static quenching it was also linear plot how do we differentiate in one case there is a lifetime dependence in the other case the lifetime is unperturbed the next is temperature by temperature we can also differentiate then also there are cases where your plot is not linear it is curved and typically in those cases you know that it is a case of mixed quenching happening that is what you just saw how do we extract the dynamic counterpart we take the lifetime ratio and you can understand okay to what extent is the dynamic contribution uh, having its effect in the total plot. Now, what about you know quenching plots with downward curvatures. Now, why do you have a downward curvature to start with the curvature you saw in the previous slide was awkward like it was moving up like this, but that means downward means it would be coming like this ok. So, some quenching plots have been shown to exhibit downward curvatures. Now, this generally arises from the different exposure of fluorophores example buried and exposed to residues in proteins right ok. So, immediately what it tells you is this I can have a protein where taking the simplest case I have two tryptophan residues one tryptophan residue is well exposed and one tryptophan residue is very much in the interior of the protein. Now, if that is the case if that is the case that means you have two 
different, you have the same fluorophore but two different subpopulations. One population is the one which is exposed and the other one which is buried. That means you have two different types of accessibilities to the quencher molecule. Now, if that is the case, this is, this is a typical situation where you would possibly see quenching clots with downward carbon, which is because you have two different subpopulations of fluorophores, so one less accessible, one much more accessible okay, or more accessible. So, this has been uh, described by a certain type of plot or this process has been described by a certain type of plot known as layer's plot. So, uh, before going to the actual uh, you know theory of this layer's plot, let us look at a protein. So, as I was telling you about uh, this uh, you know accessible non accessible. So, this is a protein called endonucleus 3 right, I have adapted this from uh, Lacquivis. Uh, so, endonucleus 3 you can see this is uh, an F e iron sulfur cluster and you look at this two cases you have two trip to fans, trip 178 and trip 132. Now, trip 132 you can understand is out here which is exposed right. Now, trip 178 you can see it is in between the two helices out here and it is buried. So, that means you already have two different populations. Now, this is what the plot would look like if you would be having F 0 by F against Q. You can see as opposed to the upward curvature we had seen before, here you can see a definite downward curvature. That means, this has been shown for endonucleus 3. So, for endonucleus 3 it has been shown that F 0 by delta F, it is not F, it is delta F and I will tell you um, sorry, uh, go, going back to the previous slide this F 0 by F, it is not delta F, F 0 by F against Q, it gives a downward curvature signifying immediately that you have two different populations, one more accessible, one less accessible. Now, how do you derive the theory for it? So, let us try to do that. So, now I will use the uh, sheets a little bit. So, we will be talking about layer's plot. Now, when we talk about layer's plot, what we meaning is this? What we meaning is we are considering two subpopulations of fluorophores, two subpopulations of fluorophores, one is exposed and the other one is buried. Now, this is essentially what we are considering, very simple, okay, two sets. Okay. Now, what we say is, so this is our how we start with the derivation, what we say is the total, the total fluorescence intensity can be written as, can be written as f, can be written as f 0 by this time you must be knowing that f 0 means that in absence of the quencher is equal to f a 0 plus f n a 0 okay. and this is equation 13. Okay. I guess the last one was 12, but if I am wrong please do correct it accordingly. Now, f 0 obviously is the total intensity in absence of any quencher. Okay. Right. Now, what is F A 0 then? F A 0 is the fluorescence intensity, the fluorescence intensity of the accessible which is A fluorophores or the accessible fluorophores in absence of quencher. Right? So, again F A 0 or F A naught is the fluorescence intensity of the accessible A stands for accessible 
flow force in absence of quenchers. So, then you can easily understand what will F n A not stand for not this will stand for fluorescence intensity of the non accessible that is why it is N A fluorophores in absence of quencher. Okay. So, it makes sense right the total fluorescence you see in absence of quencher should be equal to the sum summation of the fluorescence coming from two different uh, sub populations one is the fluorescence of the accessible uh, portion F A naught in absence of the quencher and the fluorescence of the not accessible portion F N A naught in absence of the quencher right. Now, suppose you are adding quenches what will happen because we are taking the non accessible portion to be non accessible totally non accessible okay let's take the most extreme case then if you are adding quenches the quenches would actually quench the intensity of the accessible quenches only right so then then what i can write is based on Turn Volmer equation. What we can say is F zero by F is equal to one plus K times concentration of Q. Okay, so this is our familiar Stern Volmer equation. However, what I'll do here is instead of writing this, what I will write like this is this I can write F A not over F A is equal to 1 plus K times Q. Okay. So, just to make the point, so this one we have already seen, we have already encountered and this is the one where F A is the first instance intensity of the accessible part, because simply speaking as we just said the non accessible portion is not being accessed by the quenches and hence it is not being quenched. Good. So, this is one part. So, then how would our combined intensity look like? So, if I now say then the total fluorescence intensity in presence of quenches the total fluorescence intensity in presence of quenches would be what? I can write F, I can write F, this is the total fluorescence quenching intensity or the total fluorescence intensity in presence of quenches is equal to F A right plus F N A. Okay. Now, we will make one more substitution please keep this in mind this is in presence of quenches this is also in presence of quencher this is also in presence of quencher okay but one thing we already have what we can write now is f is equal to if you go back to what we had done just in the previous sheet of paper f a naught by f a is equal to 1 plus k times q so here i already have an expression where f a is equal to f a naught by 1 plus k times q so then what i can write out here is I can replace this by F A naught 1 plus K times Q plus now see what I am writing I am writing this one to be F N A naught. Okay. Now, why am I writing this to be F N A naught? Remember our assumption was that F N A is equal to F N A naught why because the n a fraction is totally not accessible to the quenches and hence it is not being quenched. So, then if it is not being quenched 
it is not going to have any change its in its first instance intensity. So, f n a in presence of quencher should be equal to f n a naught which was the same in the absence of the quencher. Okay. So, now having said that what we can do now is uh, for the simplify. So, how we will simplify what we will do is we have these two equations. So, we have these two equations uh, one is this uh, number 14 and one is uh, what we have uh, what we had uh, started with before number 13. So, now what we can do is we can say equation 13 minus 14 gives us what remember we are trying to get a very simple equation how simple is it we will see later, but how do we get it. So, so then this will tell me that f 0 minus f is equal to remember f 0 is equal to f n naught plus f n a naught then I can write this one as f a naught minus f a naught 1 plus k times q right and the concentration or rather the first instance of n f n a cancels out why because f n a is equal to f n a naught right. So, then if on further amplification uh, simplification I can write f 0 minus f is equal to what can I write I can write f a naught I can do this k times q over 1 plus k times concentration of q. So, let this be number equation number 15. Okay. So, we are already have an equation like this, where this f 0 minus f can be replaced by delta f or I can write delta f is equal to f a naught k q 1 plus k times Okay. So, let this be let this 15 a let this be 15 b. Now, where do we go from here one more simplification we need. So, what we do now is we divide equation 13 by 15 say b it does not matter which one I am taking whether it is 15 a or 15 b. So, then what we are having is f naught by delta f is equal to this is what we have for f naught plus f n a naught. Then what we just derive for delta f this is f a naught k times concentration of q over 1 plus k times concentration of q. Okay. Now, we do a minor simplification. So, that means what we do is we get f 0 by delta f is equal to this f a naught plus f a f n a naught I bring down. So, I can have 1 plus k times concentration of q over f n a f a naught over f a naught plus f n a naught times concentration of q still not done. So, what we do after this is the way we express this we can write it like this f naught over delta f is equal to 1 plus k times q this is f a times k q. Now, what is f a? So, f a is equal to f a naught over f a naught plus f n a naught. Now, this is important to understand what f a is. f a is then you can realize what f a is f a is the fraction of initial fluorescence accessible to the quenches. Now, this is what is important what you are saying is C f a this is equal to f a naught plus f a naught plus f n a naught. Now, f a naught plus f n a naught is equal to f naught or f 0 and this f a naught. So, this can be written as f a naught over f 0 is not it. So, it immediately says if my total in intensity is f 0 then f a naught over f 0 would be the fraction of the initial fluorescence which is already accessible to the quencher molecules. Okay. So, now going further 
going further using this equation using this equation going further what I can write is I can write f 0 by delta f is equal to 1 by f a times k concentration of q plus now you can see already have 1 by f a right. So, let this be equation number 16 this is commonly referred to as the layers plot this is commonly referred to as the layers plot. So, what you can see now so what you can see now is if I if I plot that means f 0 by delta f and remember this delta f is equal to f naught minus f versus 1 by concentration of q what am I going to get I am going to get a straight line right I am going to get a straight line. Now, if I am going to get a straight line then see straight lines are always simpler to interpret. Now, this is why we went to this derivation I told you that we are going to get a simpler expression at least something which we can deal with a little more easily. So, if this is what we have then you can understand from here from the straight line plot there is a linear plot this is a linear plot. So, the intercept is equal to 1 by f a and the slope is equal to 1 by f a times q. Okay. These two are very important uh, you know parameters of this equation. So, if you have to write it now if you have to write it now or if you have to look at the plot this is how the plot will look like and that now let us look at the slide again. So, this is typically how it looks okay. you look at endo nucleus you look at endo nucleus again. So, this is this was the plot before right this was the downward curvature plot where I said two different uh, for, for uh, accessibilities. Now, you can the same plot you can see what I have done is I have plotted f 0 by delta f you know the thing we just derived and this is the plot you are looking at here this is 1 by f a which is the intercept and this is 1 by f a times k which is the slope here f a is 0 0.47 which what it means is remember this was the fraction accessibility what it means is out of the total initial intensity or uh, whatever it was close to 50 percent or 0.47 or 0.5 fraction was accessible to the quenching molecules right. So, but remember one thing this is just a case or an example where we have taken two different quenches or two different uh, populations not quenches populations the floor for one which is fully exposed and the other one which is fully buried, but then you are not going to have the same thing all the time. So, what might be happening is one might be partially buried partially exposed the other one might be you know more buried less buried well you, you can be having a combination of many things. So, you can understand that this plot will not will always not be so easy to interpret, okay. but anyway this is one way you can simplify it right. And so, just to uh, you know end the class today what I will uh, tell you is this we have gone through these uh, different types uh, static dynamic or dynamic static I have not talked about sphere of action, but then we have talked about this layers plot or this uh, accessibility uh, situation where you will be having different uh, you know quencher accessibilities right. Then let us look at a case of variable quenching in variable quenching what I mean by variable quenching is this that means now let us not talk about layers plot okay. just forget it let us uh, consider a very simple uh, linear plot either static or dynamic does not matter what it is. Now, suppose you have a protein which has a tryptophan at the very exposed portion and another protein which is tryptophan at a very less exposed portion then what is going to happen now I am talking about a single tryptophan now and if you are going to plot f 0 by f against concentration of q then you can see the exposed portion would be more quenched and hence the slope is higher the buried portion would be less quenched and obviously the slope is lower. So, this is how you can figure out remember we talked about this how can we figure out between exposure and buried this is what it is this is how you can figure out. Okay. So, you can again see out here there is a case for uh, liver alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, here is a case of layers plot again you can see the downward curvature the downward curvature. So, this is uh, uh, this uh, uh, enzyme liver alcohol uh, dehydrogenase the exposed portion and the buried portion you can see the exposed portion all has a higher slope sorry the exposed portion has a higher slope and the buried portion has a lower slope. Not only that how do you figure it out or how did the uh, people who did the experiment figure it out. So, what they did was remember the buried tryptophan has a 
lower wavelength emission maximum than the exposed tryptophan. So, that is what you see the body tryptophan for monitoring the body tryptophan what they did was they monitored the emission at 323 nanometers and for the exposed they monitored at 350 nanometers and that is how they came uh, or you know they came around to plotting these two different graphs for the buried the slope is smaller for the exposed the extent of quenching is much more and that is understood. So, in a nutshell this is where uh, I am going to stop today, but in a nutshell we have uh, discussed uh, quenching. Now, quenching is used a lot for uh, uh, you know studying protein folding, especially where we are trying to look at the accessibility right. And you know this is also very unique, why it is so unique because if you are you know talking about circular diachronism which we are going to talk about later. This what it tells you is this the circular diachronism or even uh, you know to a certain extent uh, FTIR or infrared it gives an idea it gives an idea about the total change in the structure. But here when you are doing this quenching remember you are looking at the quenching of tryptophan when you are looking at the quenching of tryptophan it does not matter to you what is happening to the rest of the protein instead the information you are getting is very local that means you are getting almost a residue specific um, information not almost you are getting a residue specific information because you are looking at the quenching of tryptophan only. However, as you must have realized not every protein has only one tryptophan some proteins might not be having tryptophans then we then possibly we try to look at tyrosine or for proteins might be having many tryptophans then obviously this analysis does become a little bit complicated not so straightforward but still but still in terms of exposure in terms of figuring out the quenching constant the extent of quenching your experiments are still valid and you can still do them it is just the interpretation that sometimes becomes difficult. Now, people uh, nowadays uh, are getting smarter. So, what they are doing is if you have say multiple tryptophans you know more than 2 more than 3 or even more than 1 what they are doing is they are mutating one tryptophan to something which is uh, equivalent. So, as not to change the gross structure hence since they have only one tryptophan now they can figure out which one is which that means to what extent is this tryptophan contributing to the quenching to what extent is the other tryptophan con uh, contribute to the quenching by mutation right. So, this is um, typically all I had to uh, tell you about quenching uh, next class now what I will do is I will uh, change the topics a little bit though fluorescence is not over because we still have to uh, talk about this uh, widely used fluorescence resonance energy transfer method. So, I am going to do is I am going to uh, change gears a little bit come out of fluorescence because we have already spent a lot of time on fluorescence look at two other techniques one is infrared and the other one is cyclo dichroism which are very frequently used in the biophysical studies of proteins and after that we are going to come back to fluorescence and look at some advanced techniques and the application of fluorescence resonance energy transfer or FRET foster resonance energy transfer okay.